All right, and welcome to my little intersection of athletic science, traditional martial arts, and niche investing. This week, I'm going to focus on the emerging battery recycling industry, as well as a bit of feedback I received regarding last week's comments about my barbell row. So starting with the battery recyclers. This is an interesting sector because it sits at the intersection of metal markets, metallurgy, battery tech, and env environmental science. Uh, when you begin to understand the kinds of materials that go into modern batteries, you appreciate that it's really a huge opportunity but also a huge responsibility that the industry carries in order to deliver on the clean tech promises that electric vehicles are aspiring towards. Uh, my disclosure here is that I have no position in any of the companies mentioned and I don't plan on initiating a position in the next 12 months. I've just been casually following the battery technology and industry for most of my adult life, so maybe I can help demystify some of the aspects of this industry for some people. At our company, Sunny Trike, we used lead acid for our initial pilot projects and are most inclined towards lithium iron phosphate for the low-speed electric vehicle market, which we came here to the Philippines to serve. So in this case, we can take some cues from the lead acid battery industry that has been operating with very high 99 to 95% recycling rate. The batteries are mostly lead, so the cathode, anode, and co current collectors are all made from lead or lead oxide. Then you have plastic casing and a strong acid. I, don't, I've, I didn't find any breakdowns online, but having taken a, a lead acid battery apart myself, I would estimate that at least 70% of the mass of the battery is either lead or lead oxide. So this recycling program has been very successful for decades, possibly the most successful recycled metal of all. Uh, and I think that that is very much due to the high trade-in value, uh, trade-in cost that they're able to offer to the end user, which incentivizes them to bring the batteries in. On the other hand, 47 sites that have previously been used for battery recycling across the U.S. have been de designated on in, as Superfund sites, and Superfund sites are specially designated areas that are slated for environmental cleanup. So it does speak to the seriousness of the kind of pollution that can be generated by battery recycling. Moving on to lithium. If we look at the most common lithium-ion battery chemistries today, uh, we'll see that the cathode and anode materials are quite different from each other, and they also constitute a smaller percentage of the total battery mass. Uh, I linked an article from Advanced Energy Materials Journal into the description that, so you can have a look for yourself. But the, the result is that this leads to a much more intricate process required to extract less marketable material, or material that can be sold later. So it's going to be a tough row to hoe for companies building this industry. Of course, metal prices are up and down. Each of these metals could get their own uh, dedicated video, um, but I'm just going to cover them quickly. So starting with nickel, as I look at the price chart in t June of 2022, nickel's price spike earlier this year to $55,000 a ton is looking a lot like the spike that we saw in April 2007. It's just that this one is way narrower because it, like, it only spiked to its highs for a day. And with nickel, it's important to recognize that all, not all mines produce battery-grade nickel. It's the nickel sulfates, which come from hard rock mines, that end up uh, finding their way into batteries. Meanwhile, nickel laterites of tropical countries like the Philippines and Indonesia cannot be used in, the, in batteries and are primarily used in stainless steel products. Uh, you'll see I mentioned a company called Share It later, which actually um, bucks that trend, but that's the exception rather than the norm. Um, so 2.4 million tons of nickel were produced in 2021. On to cobalt. So cobalt, 68% of which comes from some of the world's gnarliest mining conditions in the heart of darkness that is the Congo. Co cobalt had a major peak in early 2018 to $93,000 a ton and has peaked at 82,000 so far in 2022. That may now be on a downtrend like most metals, but who knows what's gonna go from here. There have been uh, conversations recently in the market about whipsaw and uh, the mining industry as the furthest upstream gets whipsawed the hardest uh, when this stuff starts to ripple through the economy. If you want a bit of cobalt exposure without exposure to war warlords and child mining, you could check out Sherit. I mentioned them just uh, 30 seconds ago. 
Uh, I've never bought it, but it showed up on a value screener for me back in 2013, and I've always had a good opinion of them. It's not for any strong fundamental reason, as I was pretty new in my investor journey when I first learned about them, but I just found it fascinating that they've been making it work with a Cuban nickel mine and a refinery in Alberta, Canada of all places. They actually do produce battery grade nickel from the laterite ore, which is pretty uncommon situation. The stock had some epic runs during the past years, but got burned by some government activism on a Madagascar project back in 2017. Right, that's nickel and cobalt. Uh, we'll move on to phosphate from here. And uh, phosphate is still trending upwards as of June at $255 per ton. Uh, which is still below the $450 spike that happened in November 2008. With so many predictions about food shortages in the coming year or two, it's entirely possible that fertilizer common commodities like phosphate will continue their uptrend despite most other commodity, uh, commodities, especially metals, trending downwards. With that being said, in 2020, barely 5% of total phosphate demand went to non-agricultural products or uses. So battery uses still barely makes a dent in global phosphate consumption. Uh, when it comes to recycling of lithium iron phosphate, which is the battery chemistry that uses phosphate, consider this. Phosphate prices at $250 per ton is about 10% of the cost of lead acid, which was around $2,500 per ton right now. Like so, as a, a very widely recycled battery, uh, lead acid is about 10 times, or lead, lead itself is about 10 times more expensive than the phosphate. Then you look at nickel, which is up in the tens of thousands, so phosphate is actually 1% of the cost of nickel. If it weren't so heavy, I think uh, lithium iron phosphate would be the most popular battery brand, but it's heavy, which makes its energy efficiency lower. Um, but it is extremely safe and quite cost competitive in a lot of applications. That's why we like it for our lower speed vehicles. So then lithium. Lithium is a pretty crazy story at the moment. Uh, the price is spiking way up and right now it's at over $70,000 a ton, which is more than four times higher than what you would maybe look at as the 10 year average before this started spiking last year. It's, it's important to think about with lithium, if we consider the P85 pack, which is 85 kilowatt hours, it's the pack that was used in the Tesla Model S. This 85 kilowatt hour pack contains around seven kilograms of lithium metal or 37 kilograms of lithium carbon equivalent. Uh, lithium carbonate being the one that has the market value in the commodities markets. So that works out to a theoretically recoverable lithium carbonate content of $2,600 at a $70,000 market. If the price crashes back down to um, the more historical levels of ten to 15000 then that drops down as well to maybe 800 And then another note that I'd like to make is that one of the leading causes of capacity degradation in lithium ion batteries is when individual lithium ions get stuck in the anode. Um, so that's between the, the, the flakes of the graphite because anodes, most commercial batteries, anodes are made from graphite. So there are some companies that are specialized in anode recycling. But the basic point that I want to make here is that there is a natural conflict between the chemistry of recovering lithium ions and recycling the anode. Plastic, paper, and graphite recycling all suffer from a common difficulty, and that's that paper is made up of lignin fibers, plastic is made up of polymer chains, and graphite is made up of layered sheets of carbon. So each time these materials get made into a product and then recycled, those fibers, polymer chains, or layered sheets get broken into smaller and smaller pieces. This generally reduces their performance um, in the original application. So hopefully uh, you can appreciate that recovering the lithium ions themselves will necessarily degrade the graphite and by recovering more lithium in the battery you might have to sacrifice the graphite anode and, and make it less recyclable. Uh, it's just one of those trade-offs that happens in engineering. So there are synthetic varieties of carbon that are available in the market. Uh, they are used in batteries. There are some companies that are observing that the content of natural graphite in these batteries is going up. But they're also a company that mines graphite, so their analysis is probably a little bit biased. There are also 
uh, anodes that are under development uh, based off silica. But as far as I know, those are still like there are companies that are selling the anode material, but I don't know of it going into any mass mass production battery cells at this time. So that's the end of my comments about the materials involved in battery recycling and the sector. Hopefully I'll do some more specific individual companies in the future videos. From here I want to make a bit of an update or addendum to last week's commentary about the barbell row. So I got my first comment about my exercise selection. The fellow who commented said that he prefers dumbbell rows over barbell rows because there are less opportunities to injure yourself. So based on that feedback, I figured it was a good time to do a little bit of extra review on the, some of the different channels that I follow to get their take on the subject. I'm still not aware of anybody who specifically programs strength training for martial arts and punching strength specifically. But the best vid that I found regarding injuries in a barbell row came from Jeremy Ethier. So I posted that below. The main injury points on a standing barbell row are either the lower back or the shoulders and neck. So like most exercises, higher weights tend to lead to sloppier form. And last video, I actually tried to justify my chicken necking based on techniques that I've seen applied in my martial arts classes. The lower back is the same issue as a deadlift. Uh, you can't be letting your lower spine bend during the lift. Where the row has specific issues is that in the shearing force that gets applied to the spine, as you accelerate the bar upwards. I also double checked about the head bopping with my Sensei Henry and also Jeff Turner who has been a great sounding board to make sure I'm not coloring too far out of the lines with this experiment I'm doing. If you look closely at the video by Ethier, um, the kind of neck bobbing that I was doing would be an example of what he's talking about. So that is doing something that would be a common point of injury doing the barbell row. And really, even if excessive neck bobbing were a valid technique to use in trapping an opponent's hand during karate, in hindsight, I recognize that I'd really be asking for trouble trying to do those sorts of fine motor movements under heavy loading like weights. So yeah, just wanted to call out some of my own BS there in order to be more attentive to that in the future weeks. For sure, the dumbbell row would be the safer option. I acknowledge that uh, and I appreciate that being pointed out. Anyways, that's it for me today. Uh, hopefully there was some commentary in there that was helpful. And I uh, always appreciate a like if, if you liked it. And uh, maybe see you in another video in the future.